Welcome back to this series of Black Hat Fast Chats. I'm Terry Sweeney, contributing editor with Black Hat. We are joined now by Isaac Kotler, CTO and co-founder of SafeBreach. And our topic today is Forget Zero Trust, Aim to Control the Controllables. Um, Isaac, thanks so much for joining us today. We've got a lot to talk about. Thank you for having me, Terry. Um, members of Safe Breach's own research team recently presented findings on Stuxnet, the 2010 computer worm uh, originally aimed at Iran's nuclear facilities. Uh, this was widely considered to be a supply chain attack. Uh, more recently, solar winds is in the headlines, and there's no doubt there will be other kinds of, of these supply chain attacks. So why don't we start by you addressing how organizations should be preparing for future supply chain attacks and just some tips for, for getting them to be safe and secure. Sure, I definitely agree with your assessment there. There's gonna be a lot more of those coming in the future. And honestly, I believe that this is now becoming the path of this resistance for adversaries. Because traditionally companies have done a great job or doing a, a better job, I should be saying, at protecting their premises and gateways the adversary is always reluctant to find their ways uh, to push forward, has now found other ways to get to the companies. And this is the supply chain issue that we're talking to. So very briefly, we can imagine supply chain to happen at two different levels. It could either be people, contractors, companies that you gave them access to your company. Uh, and we'll talk about in a second, we can consider those as an inside threat model basically what happened when one of our employees go, going wrong. And then the other is when we buy a software from a vendor and that vendor get compromised and then their, their software has been weaponized against us as a customer, right? And again, we can consider this also in our, in our threat model. So separating these two issues, when we think about what happens when a supply chain vendor of us get compromised and when he or she has <clears throat> credentials to our company, to a VPN, then again, this is very much equivalent to an inside threat where we need to understand what can an employee today, if he or she get hacked, what can happen to our company? It's no different from this scenario because the adversary has a valid credentials. On the other spectrum, when we think about a software that is being compromised, again, we need to consider the defense in depth thinking about what does that software come in touch with? What kind of access we granted this appliance or software? And then we can deduce the impact. That's really helpful context. Um, dovetailing on that is a uh, article that you wrote for the Forbes Tech Council recently, where you discuss some of the potential downsides of zero trust. Um, you are advocating as well for an approach of constant vigilance by quote unquote, controlling the controllables, which is a, a, a great slogan. Tell us a bit more about what you mean by controlling the controllables and what some of the pragmatic steps are that security teams might take to achieve that. Sure. So first of all, I think, you know, it's, it's fair to say that zero trust is, is a great security solution and it's definitely something companies should consider, by, by no doubt. I think that there is a, a, a challenge implementing zero trust in companies because it involves not, not more than just technology. It process, it's the way the companies operate in order to reach a true zero trust um, deployment. And so in, instead of trying to have this kind of aiming toward this, what could be perceived as unachievable goals for many companies, we should try to kind of set our eyes to a different place. And this is, as you mentioned, to be a constant vigilance when it comes to your security. There is already so much that we know, Terry, about how adversaries operate, from the MITER attack to publicly known threat intelligence reports that indicates the different TTPs that are used by adversaries. It's a waste that we don't take all this data and weaponize it to help us understand how safe we are. If we know a certain adversary is using a tool, let's say a Mimikatz, a publicly known tool to do credential harvesting and pass the hash, it's a shame that we don't try this tool right now on our premises to understand if it will trigger any of our defenses because we know the adversary is going to use it. Why wait? Why wait and not operating on this data? 
And so what I call out for companies is that we don't control which vendors of ours will get compromised. We don't know which software company will be the next victim or which subcontractors might get compromised. But what we can control is our own playground as a company, our networks and security stack, the adversary can make those decisions for us. Anything from the way we segment our networks to the way that we control our rules and, and alarms. And so by continuously practicing this notion, by making sure that we lay the right booby traps and the right um, controls in place, we can actually control the scenario. Uh, and that's okay. what I was advocating for. What, what, what would be like your top three controllables? Like if we were to point organizations to, to things that are within their control, what, what are two or three things that are most likely to pop up regularly across industries? Sure. So I, I think, you know, the, the, the first thing that you'll be surprised to learn there, or not surprised uh, will be that companies don't really have much visibility into an outbound traffic. And so as we see more and more ransomwares that are not only encrypting the data in companies, but also stealing the data so they can also um, use the shaming uh, cap cap capacities to force companies into paying them, right? To publicly right. humiliating them by posting their, their data on the internet. We're looking at the classical data breach scenario. How is that data? I mean, it's one way to get to the database with the data. It's a whole other thing to exfiltrate the data to perhaps a cloud server, right? So having a better control of the, on the outbound traffic is something that can um, increase your security posture. And um, moving in to the end point, so many companies don't have a, a very tight control around necessarily around what endpoint users, end users, sorry, can do on their workstation. I mean, some companies do have um, golden images or a more systematical approach to threats, Terry, but as we all kind of, you know, experienced from COVID-19, the remote workforce has actually um, created a situation where employees may be working out of their personal laptops, spouse laptops, uh, you know, connecting to the companies from unsafe locations, and so, again, having a better insight into what's happening on the endpoint and limiting the cap capacity of users' mistake can also greatly go into that. And last but not least, it's also sometimes referred to as the m, &M model of security, which is hard on the inside, soft on the inside, sorry, hard <laughs> on the outside, soft on the inside, is that many times still we don't see enough segmentation and enough security controls once you're inside the corporate network or within a company. And so again, increasing your visibility on the endpoint, your outbound network and your inside um, network structure greatly will increase your capabilities to handle such, such attacks. Okay. Isaac, I know I get this question quite a bit, um, but let's let's review it one more time. Why and how is breach and attack simulation different from penetration testing? And as a component of that, can you talk also about how and when they complement each other? Sure. So I think, first of all, the, the, the term pen testing is a little bit overloaded because different companies and different stakeholders will think about pen testing differently. Um, so, for instance, testing your corporate website against SQL injection can be qualified as a pen testing, but at the same time, testing the capacity of an employee to become an inside threat might not be qualified as a pen testing, or infrastructure hardening may not be tested against adversaries. The bridge attack simulation comes to create a complementary solution to application security and other ways to measure risk by trying to create a more horizontal approach. So bridge attack simulations accommodates purple team and red team by creating the entire full kill chain perspective, not necessarily focusing on vulnerabilities like some pen testing or vulnerability assessment will be, not entirely focused or on the um, external assets as some pen testing may be with SQL injection, but really understanding what the adversary can do to you once they are positioned in certain assets, 
in certain network segments and etc. And the overall value is essentially in making you better informed of the risk, is to having you understand the different data points that can happen within your company, augmenting it with vulnerabilities and other risks that you already consume to make an informed decision. Think the, the look at Martin Kilchin approach has educated us that it's impossible to stop the adversaries at all the different points. We need to choose the choke points that our company decided to invest it in. We need to understand where things are playing in our favor. And so understanding how the data comes together to support it will be fundamental for us to know where to strike against the adversary as opposed to running all over the place, trying to do everything and still lose the battle. Sure, okay. In that vein, Gartner and IDC both recently listed breach and attack simulation as critical tools or trends in 2021. Why do you think that breach and attack simulation is finally gaining um, traction and recognition among security teams? Um, what are some of the drivers as well for this increased interest in the technology right now? So I think there's a couple of things that are you know, operating in favor of this market. So first of all, I would say that as adversarial sophistication keeps coming up on top, it's clear that um, we need to do something more than what we've already done. I mean, if you think about it, most of the companies that got breached in the recent years already have their firewalls and antiviruses and different mandatory security controls, yet still something was missing. As you think about it, the value of simulation is something that um, initially we can see at, um, at organizations such as the DOD and the military, where it was considered to be almost a, a privilege to a sort to have the funding and the money to run these different exercises, right? But as the technology matures, as things become more and more friendly, this kind of value proposition boils down and is now available to enterprise everywhere. You don't have to be the DOD to run a campaign right now to see, for instance, how dark side uh, can attack your company. And again, we talked about it that thanks to the um, different open source intelligence um, frameworks such as the MITRE attack, for instance, and the different TPPs and the IOCs and the sharing the community is doing, there is enough data today that with the right technology can be weaponized and safely simulate those things for you. Now, other contributes that we can see is also that if we think about how rapidly our IT expands today, it's no longer a mission. So you can say, well, Isaac, my company has a red team or a purple team, they can help me. Well, this is true and they can definitely do a great job, something that we can help them in the process. But as we see how far expanding our IT becomes with the cloud, with, for instance, 5G and IoT, it's clear that we need automation on our side. Adversaries, again, to some degree, are automating as well. When they're send, sending phishings to the entire company base, when they're trying to attack at large, they're using malware. They're not spending human capital on each and one of the targets. And so it only makes sense that we return to the same coin that we also weaponize their IOCs and TTPs and automate it in our favor. And once we find out first before them about where the gaps are, we have the luxury of time and fixing it. And so as more and more companies and industries, verticals understand this benefit, the more adaptation the market sees. It sounds like what we're talking about is a combination of intelligence and, and pragmatism with this controlling the controllables approach. Isaac, thanks again for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Terry. This has been Terry Sweeney for Black Hat. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you on this next Black Hat Fast Chat.